Yes. Yes. I can't see. There you are. Stand up if you don't mind. Steve Schlesinger. I think it's a very important question. Was there a, a set of policy choices that could have been taken? And I think on day one, the answer is yes, there was. And that would have been to empower, authorize, and not block Sheila Baer from doing her job. You had a set of financial institutions that were not only insolvent, practically, or nearly insolvent, they were deeply implicated in a whole raft of unacceptable practices. It is the responsibility under the law of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to intervene in that situation. It's called the Prompt Corrective Action Law. Uh, and it's, it's very clearly, and there's a reason for it. The reason is simply that the taxpayers are on the hook for depositors' funds. And when you allow an institution in this condition to slide close to insolvency, there is a great risk that those losses will multiply. So you stop it. And there, there are protocols for doing that. The regulators move in on Friday. The institution reopens on Monday morning. There's a new top echelon of leadership. Uh, there is uh, uh, audits are launched. People doing them are not implicated in the previous deal, so you get a clean account of what the actual condition of the enterprise is. You insure all of the deposits so there's no panic, and everybody goes on doing business. The, the, or, the enterprise does not grow. It does not pay out its revenues in exorbitant bonuses, and it doesn't falsify its books, and you don't relax the accounting standards. So these were specific steps which the administration could and should have done differently. Instead, it announced that it was going to stress test the banks. No regulator I have ever talked to thinks that you discuss the results of a stress test with the institution and adjust it before uh, recording the result. That's not a real stress test. That's a public relations exercise. Right? And the purpose of it was to persuade the markets and everybody else that the government would back the banks to the hill, which they did. That's the point at which you could have changed everything. Yes, sir. Well, Dad was certainly an advocate of full employment as a policy. Um, the question is, how do you go about achieving it in the present environment? And I think we have to recognize that the situation is different than it was in 1930. In 1930, you had vast numbers of young men who were displaced from the farms. Right? The traditional thing you did with young men from the farms is you put them to work on roads with actual shovels. I mean, that's what they did in the in the uh, WPA and the, uh, uh, and the Civilian Conservation Corps. That's not the situation we have now. So my, my view is that the pursuit of a full employment policy has to be done in a different way. Our workers are mostly in the services. They're mostly doing valuable and important things in those areas. Many of them are teachers, for example, police, firemen. Right? What's happening out there in the cities and states is that those people's people are being laid off because their local and state governments cannot afford to keep them. Right? There was a simple fix for this. We could have enacted a general revenue sharing program, not going back to Roosevelt, but only going as far as Nixon, a really perfectly short period of time, that would have stabilized the budgets of states and localities. For lots of political reasons, we didn't do it. 
We could have federalized Medicaid, effectively putting funds in the hands of states and localities and stabilizing their budgets. It's a different distributional impact, but it would have done the job. We didn't do that. There, we need to think of things which are appropriate to our conditions that will work and that will work reasonably quickly. Sim it, the stimulus bill, the ARRA, had some useful things in it. It did some good, but it did not effectively put us on the path toward reducing unemployment, toward economic recovery. And as a result, most people who were anxiously looking for jobs are still out there looking for it. And that's where the disaster lies. Yes. Yes. Well, now, we can observe people's behavior, but we can really never experience what they experience. I've learned that. Uh, is it possible? I remember reading, and you may have been on your father wrote this, but when they brought the Securities and Exchange Act in 1933 as amended, they brought the biggest thief of all in to help write it. Joe Kennedy. <laughs> I'm wondering, and I, I just back to this off you, if Obama may have thought that by bringing Summers in and Geithner, because basically the New York Fed these days is the Fed. Everybody else is still with I'll tell is Richard Fitcher you said that. <laughs> 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 I think where it, he may go in the next two years. If his thinking was like that, maybe he, he will change here. But if his thinking was influenced otherwise, that's my, my concern. I think it's possible that Larry Summers had this view, that the problems could only be solved by Larry Summers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I don't know the answer to that question. This is a puzzle to me. I studied Obama... Uh, for a year before he actually ran. And I watched him during the campaign, and I did have a totally different impression from how he's performed. I thought he was going to be forward-looking and reach out and bring in people outside the conventional wisdom, and he didn't. And I don't understand why, except that as a young black man, he probably didn't want to appear to be Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. He didn't have a lot of experience in the real world. You look, read his books. Uh, he had not very much experience in the real world. But let, let me frame this in a little bit of historical context. If you, if you look at the, what we know about Kennedy, we know about Johnson, uh, and what we know about some, in fact, some of the Republican administrations of our time, they all had, the president was a figure of considerable experience and rich and diverse contacts. Right? Johnson knew everybody in official Washington and a great many people outside. Right? So when his advisors uh, weren't sat giving him satisfactory advice, he had options. He was glued to the telephone. Uh, for Kennedy, this was especially true in foreign policy. He had given over the major inside posts to senior figures from the establishment, to Dean Rusk, to McGeorge Bundy. Um, when he had a sense that his military advisors were giving him reckless advice, as was true on Laos, and was true on Cuba, he had people to talk to who he knew would give him a different perspective. I don't have the sense, and again, we don't know yet, but I don't have any sense that in this administration, the president has the capacity to reach out beyond his own circle of advisors. And that's, I think, as true on the major economic issues of domestic policy as it is on foreign policy. Last question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir.
First of all, what were the challenges in the Navy? And secondly, did your father ever regret recommending McNamara to Kennedy? And the third is, do you see his background as agricultural economics and also as a Canadian having an impact on this world view? Ah, wow. That was just one question. I, 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 they, they, answer my, one, because we no, are I, out no, of time. No, I'm going to try an, to answer all three, if I, if I could, because they're all important questions. First of all, editing this book was a pure joy. It involved no work at all. Uh, the, the Library of America did a marvelous job with authoritative texts, and so it, that was not part of my responsibility. I, I did the chronology of Dad's life, which was a great deal of fun, and uh, there are a few things in there which would not be in there if a member of the family hadn't written it. So. Uh, but I have to say, it's a, it's a marvelous experience to, to have your book, to have a book come out through the Library of America because they, they, they cherish the book and they do a beautiful, beautiful job. Um, the second question, did he ever regret uh, recommending Bob McNamara? No. Uh, and my father and McNamara remained friends throughout my father's life uh, and uh, continued to meet in the summers in Vermont. People, I think, do not understand who the role that Bob McNamara played uh, in through much of this history uh, and how closely allied he was with my father's view and with, the pres with President Kennedy's view on Vietnam in the period 1961 to 1963. Uh, but this was, in fact, a very tightly held uh, 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 alliance uh, whose objective was to uh, prevent the introduction of combat troops in Vietnam and led to Kennedy's decision to start the withdrawal of the advisors who were there, a uh, decision that was taken in October of 63. Uh, McNamara is an enormously complex person, but his loyalty to his office and to his superiors, both Kennedy and Johnson, was enormous. I came to admire him, and I must say, uh, as I grew to understand him a little, I came to admire him a great deal uh, very late in his life. Uh, third question, uh, on my father's background in agriculture and in Canada. Uh, again, since my father emerged out of economic life, and again, not out of some obscure scientific discipline, uh, I think this did give him a particular perspective. It made him comfortable with the institutionalist tradition. Um, it get, made him uh, knowledgeable of first principles uh, in a practical way that someone who hasn't been uh, a, a farmer often cannot be. Uh, he started his career, if you like that, to phrase it that way, writing a column uh, under a pseudonym uh, for uh, the local newspaper in uh, uh, St. Thomas, Ontario. Was the pseudonym John Maynard Keene? No, it was, it was, it was the, the, the page man or sometimes the plow man. Uh, and it was about farming practices. And there, a, a new book published by, uh, in Canada this year collects those columns, which otherwise would have disappeared from the fading pages of a newspaper. It's quite interesting. Uh, the, uh, I think the Canadian perspective gave him a certain detachment uh, that served him well. Uh, but it also was useful in one important pu public function. And around 1963, uh, when my father came back from India, uh, there was a need to negotiate a new uh, air traffic agreement between Canada and the United States to accommodate jet aircraft and the longer distances they could travel and so on. Uh, and uh, in a meeting with the Prime Minister, Lester Pearson, Kennedy said, well, I think I'll appoint Ken Galbraith uh, to negotiate for us on this. And Pearson said, what an excellent idea. He's a good Canadian. I'll appoint him too. Uh, <laughs> and so my father was the only one-man binational <laughs> negotiating commission, I think, possibly in the history of the, of the world. So Thank you very much.